Namaste. So, Danielle's next question is about psychic powers. Are they indicators of progress in self-realization, or are they just a distraction on the path? He asks. Well, like everything, it depends on how you look at it. <laughs> Remember, self-realization, enlightenment, changes nothing. It's not like the whole world is also, also going to be wonderful and that everybody is going to love you. <laughs> that, that's a dream of heaven or something like that. But psychic powers are the same. They don't really change anything. Things are happening, okay? The universe is going on according to the impulse of creation with its own energy and its own intelligence, as I was trying to point out last time. And that intelligence is distributed. But there is a center to it, and the center has no edges, and that is the self. So if you start to realize the self, of course, you become a party to, you become connected with that intelligence. So naturally, you begin to pick up on things uh, without even trying. You become so sensitive to your own energy and having it balanced in a certain way. And so just like this morning, there was a lady smoking outside my window. <laughs> and she's done it before, several times. And I had to get a little heavy with her. I had to told, tell her, you know, look, I'm doing some heavy-duty ritual magic here. And every time you contaminate the atmosphere here with smoke, I have to cleanse it and start all over again. So, you know, <laughs> what am I doing? Am I exercising psychic powers? Well, you could say yes. But from my point of view, it's not I who is the doer. It's God. Huh? Let my Narasingha do it. Let my Ganesh do it. Let my Kundalini Devi do it. <laughs> So when Kundalini rises, huh? the snake coming up, it's not that I'm thinking, oh, this is my Kundalini in my body rising to the top of my head and causing my intelligence and energy to expand or whatever. <laughs> That would be a total ego trip. That would be the opposite of enlightenment. Uh -huh. so some people have this model or view of enlightenment where they, the ego, becomes more and more powerful until I am God. Uh -huh. Which is actually the farthest away from enlightenment <laughs> that you can get. But the, the real sadhu is becoming so, so sensitive that he tunes into the mind of God. And he starts to see the ego as a disturbance in the mind of God. And he starts to see the mind as an artificial, you know, the individual mind as an artificial wall, an imaginary boundary in the mind of God, dividing it into I and not I. So if there is no difference anymore between I and not I, at least on the mental level, then one gains access to the keys, huh? what God is up to what's happening, okay, by the will of the omnipotent. 
And so if, if you evince knowledge of that, it may seem like you have psychic powers or that you're exercising uh, some kind of special magic or something. But that would be to look at it from the point of view of, I am the doer. But we aren't the doers. <laughs> Just try to do something, huh? something substantial, you know, like hold your breath for two minutes or stand on your head for five minutes or learn a musical instrument. Try to do something substantial and see how many obstacles come up, how many breakdowns there are. How many problems you have to overcome? Well, why is that? Why doesn't it just happen like magic? Huh? Because we see, for example, in the springtime, all the buds come out on the flowers and bushes and trees. And everything blooms very nicely and smiles at the sun for a season. This is going on. It's an amazing act of coordinated living intelligence, and yet it's effortless. There is no doer. Where is the doer? Who's doing this? See, it just happens. Nature happens. The universe happens. Life happens. But depending on our point of view on it, we can try to take credit for it or not. We could try to push it in a certain direction, which is called desire, which is usually always a train wreck. Huh? <laughs> or we can just go with the flow and cooperate. What a concept. Cooperate with God. Cooperate with nature, with what's already happening. And be a part of it instead of being apart from it. Be a player on the field instead of a spectator in the stands. You see, Western duality makes you a spectator in the stands, apart from life, isolated from the real cause of things. And you just can watch. You can't really intervene or influence anything. But Eastern philosophy says, no, jump in, man. <laughs> the water's fine. Become a cooperator, become a, a co-creator with God. See, use whatever portion of God's powers are allotted to you by your qualities, by your abilities, see, and use that for God's purposes. This is critical. Not for some separatist agenda. Then you get more, huh? The parable of the, uh, the sower and the seeds is applicable here. Uh, that, that one old man went away, leaving his three sons an equal measure of his seeds and said, now I'm going away for seven years, probably going to on pilgrimage or something. And uh, when I come back, I'll see whichever one of you has done the best. And he will become uh, my uh, inheritor. So the old man went away and the first son said, well, I better just, you know, hold on to these seeds. I better not lose them. So he put them away in, the, in a dusty storeroom uh, and forgot about it. Another son said, oh, let me see what I can get for these seeds on the market. So he went down to the market and sold the seeds and got cash and tried to keep it. And the third son said, let me work hard and sow these seeds and raise them up to make more seeds. And because the old man was gone for seven years, he had seven seasons to, to work the land and farm with those seeds that he had. And he turned it into a huge, you know, doubled and doubled and doubled again. So when the old man came back, of course, he gave his 
uh, legacy to the third son because the third son had demonstrated the most uh, intention, initiative, and creative action to manifest the old man's purpose. So the same thing is true of God. We're granted a certain amount of energy, intelligence, and so on. And if we use that to further God's purpose, then we get more. It's very simple. So what is God's purpose? It's not so inscrutable. <laughs> it's not so mysterious, is it? He wants everybody to be happy and enjoy this wonderful show, this appearance uh, that he's created for us. And not be hung up on things. Huh? Not be hung up on that there are other creatures more powerful than we are. Or not to be hung up on the fact that we have to die. Or at least the body has to die. But to, to get the point of this whole creation. You know, every, every work of art has meaning. What is the meaning of this creation? Huh? Well, as Ramana Maharshi would say, the meaning of creation is for you to be able to ask this question. For you to be able to ask, what is the meaning of creation? Is the purpose of the creation? To produce a, a life form, a form of awareness that is capable of self-reflection and self-realization, and yet somehow blocked from it. How? By egotism, by the concept of individuality. See, the animals and plants don't have that, and so they don't get into trouble like we do. They simply go with the flow. They follow the natural law, even if it's brutal. And they don't complain about it. See? Because the brutality of animal life, for example, is a reflection of the karma of the beings who have to take those forms, who have to inhabit those activities. And similarly, in human life, I mean, the range of human life is incredible incredible range from complete savagery and animalistic, you know, badassery of various kinds, all the way up to the highest realms of spirituality and genius and art. See, if we start to conceive of God as an artist, then what is the meaning or what is he trying to say here? Is he trying to say, become a competitor with me, try to outdo me? Huh? Then you wind up becoming a, a devil, fighting with God, a demon, Hiranyakashipu. And then Narasimha has to come along and wipe you out so that life can go on. But if you cooperate, if you fall in tune with God's message, with his meaning, with his purpose for his creation, then you find your life being facilitated in mysterious ways from behind the scenes. Huh? And you don't take credit before, for it because you know better. You know you're not the doer. You know these things are happening because God wants it to happen. This flower is blooming because God ordains it. Uh, he says, even the hairs on your head are numbered. Everything is counted for. Not, a, not any detail overlooked in the law of karma. It's inconceivable. You know, I mean, it requires incredible distributed intelligence and, and a processing power. Uh, uh, an infra a computing infrastructure that goes down to the quark level. Maybe beyond, we don't know. But it's all about information and intelligence and consciousness. And that consciousness is real and we can tune into it and we can become part of it and we can become a party to its perceptions and 
its purposes. And that is the purpose of life. Om Tat Sat. Om Harihi Om.